Good morning, church family. Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. Uh, anyone who celebrated their birthday or is going to celebrate their birthday in the coming couple of days? No birthdays? We missed it last week. We missed it last week. Um, is there a version to sing happy birthday in post tense? <laughs> Let's sing happy birthday to Rosie. Don't happy birthday for last week. Happy birthday for, for last week, Rosie. All right. Should we try this version? Happy birthday for last week, Rosie. No, don't, don't. Just let's sing happy birthday, Rosie. Happy belated birthday to you, Rosie. Um, as a congregation, we express our sympathy to Ruby McGill on the death of her sister, Jean Orr. Her funeral was on Friday. Please remember Ruby and the family in your prayers. Taking care training is obligatory for new and experienced leaders and helpers. Uh, within the Presbyterian Church in Ireland for all those who are working with under 18s, children or teenagers, and themselves are 18 or over. The next training will be on Tuesday, the 25th of June, uh, from half seven to nine in St. Andrews, Bangor. Check your emails or check the organization leader um, and would you please come and attend? If it's not possible, then um, then there's there are other um, appointments available. Just ask about that. Um, there will be refreshments served before in the welcome center, and it's free of charge for us. Our call to worship is based on Psalm 36, verses 5 and 6. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save all of creation, O Lord, so please help us to depend fully upon you. Let's stand and sing our opening praise, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
I was relieved to see that um, we have boys and girls this morning, so would you please make your way to the front? I was worried, will we have any children today? Or do we have to do something else in the spot of children's talk? But you came for, um, for the cool church kids party. Good morning. Good to see you all. Can you tell me what this is? This is a phone, a mobile phone. Um, do you think, you know, what powers the mobile phones? What keeps them running so we can use them? Battery. battery? All right, what do you have to do with the batteries? So it's not enough to put in a battery and, and it's good to go, but, but you need to plug it in and, and charge the battery. What happens when we are uh, plugging in the charger? Yeah, um, it, it increases the electricity um in in the battery so electricity is going in and when we are using the phone then then we are using up the electricity do you think we can check how much electricity is in the phone yeah yeah how so it uses when you can have the top it changes battery oh you know everything about mobile phones <laughs> yeah yeah so at the top corner um there, there's a V sign, and can you see the number as well, or just, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah in, in most phones. So if, if, I, if I turn on like the torch function, can you tell if there is electricity in this phone? Yeah, yeah? so there's some electricity in the, in the battery. Can you tell me how much electricity is there in the phone? Like That's your best guess? Or, or is it because, because it's bright? 40, 146, okay. 37. 37? 39. 39, all right, there's no. 73. Oh, let's see, what is the closest? I think 73, no, 100 is the closest because it's 87. Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> so 100 was the closest, guess. Um, there's 87% there's of electricity left in the phone. Uh, but you cannot tell by just turning on a function or not. Uh, and, and when you are turning on functions, the, the, the electricity, is, electricity is not going like that. You cannot only use the torch for two minutes or, or five minutes because, because the phone is only using a very tiny amount of electricity at a time. But after a while, you need to plug it in to, to charge it up, right? Is that your experience? Are your parents' phones are working the same way as well? Yeah, all right, good. Phones need just a very little bit of electricity to power on. I shared this idea of how a phone only needs a little electricity to run well, because I think it helps us to think about what Jesus is teaching his disciples today. I'm going to read that from Luke chapter 17, verses 5 and 6. Listen to what Jesus said. Um, the apostles, the disciples said to Jesus, increase our faith. We want to have bigger, more faith, stronger faith. Increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you had faith, like the size of a mustard seed, you could say to the smallberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Today's scripture, the disciples are asking Jesus to increase our faith, give us stronger faith, bigger faith, greater faith. But Jesus tells them that greater or stronger faith doesn't help them to do God's work any better. Like Jesus tells his disciples that just a very little, itty bitty tiny faith, the faith of the size of the mustard seed, is all that you need in order to do amazing things. So I don't know if you've seen mustard seeds before. Have you seen mustard seeds? Do you know how big a mustard seed is? Do you want to come closer? Okay. I will show you some, some regular size seeds. Do you recognize them? Yeah. I got them from, from my bird's feed. 
So these are what, what the birds are eating. Those are the sizes. You see um, how, how big they are. Now, I've got some mustard seed here. Do you see? Tiny. That's tiny. Yeah. In, do you see how, how tiny those are? It is mustard seed, yeah. Oh, um, do, you, do you all see? You can take one if you would like. Just one tiny piece. If you want to hold it in your hand, you don't have to. But, but you see, there are darker ones, there are lighter ones. But which one is bigger? Can you help me? Which one is bigger? Is that or that one there? That one. That one. So the mustard seed is, is that, is that like half the size of a normal seed? No. no? no. Smaller? Yeah, a lot smaller than, than half the size. Those are the wee tiny mustard seeds. There are like 100 on, on this plate already. So tiny, tiny bits. And Jesus said that you don't have to have big, big, strong faith to do big things for God, to obey God, to walk with God, to, to believe in Him. Just have a tiny, like, like a mustard seed. And then at another passage, Jesus is, is telling us that if you have a faith like, like this tiny, the kingdom of heaven is like this tiny, tiny beginning. But if you plant it and then it grows to a big, big tree, it can go to a 10-foot tree so birds can live on that tree. They can build a nest for themselves and they can feel comfortable. Just imagine a 10-feet big tree from this tiny seed. Jesus is telling us that we don't have to have huge, big, big faith. A tiny one is enough for us and big things can grow from that tiny faith. But we need to put our faith, our trust in Jesus. How can... Uh, you, you told me that, that we need to recharge the phone batteries um, so it wouldn't run f flat. We need to recharge our faith as well. What do you think? How can we recharge our faith? Charging, Charging our faith, yeah. What do you think? How can we recharge? Like, like we are recharging <coughs> the battery of the phone. <coughs> don't, um, don't do anything with electricity and plugs and, and anything like that. Well, you can recharge your body if you are sleeping, if you have some proper rest. Yes, I like that. How can you recharge your faith? Okay. If, um, if you read God's word, if, if you read about um, how God planned this life for you, what God thinks about you, what he thinks about life, then, then you can recharge your faith. If, if you pray to God, if you pour out your heart to Him, and, and if you listen to Him, do you think there's any other way we can recharge our faith? Any other ways? Praying to God, yes, I love it. I love it. Also, coming to church, meeting with others who love Jesus. Also, worshipping God together, singing to Him, telling him, what we think of him, how great he is, how powerful he is. I love a good singing. And, and we all prefer different music styles. But you can, you can choose what, uh, what music you like to listen at home, what songs you like to sing at home, what helps you to recharge your faith, your trust. It's good to praise God, to tell him how, how good he is and what he has done for us. It's good to talk to other Christians, other believers. So reading the Bible, praying, coming to church, worshiping God, being honest with him, that all helps us uh, to recharge our faith. We don't need to do huge, big things. Just remember, tiny seed, like a mustard seed, can, can end up in a big, big tree where lots of birds can, can find shelter. Yeah. Uh, now, I would like to invite you to put your hands together and we are going to pray together. This is a line-by-line line prayer. So I'm saying one short line. Would you please repeat after me that prayer? Yeah, let us pray. 
Dear God, dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus, who taught us to recharge our faith, who taught us to recharge our faith, so that we can keep sharing, so that we can keep sharing your love and gifts with others, your love and gifts with others, just like Jesus did, just like Jesus did. Thank you and Amen. Thank you and Amen. God is great, and he's got the whole world in his hands. Let's stand to sing that praise together. Time for cool church kids party. Have fun. God bless you and see you next Sunday. In Psalm number 90, verse 12, we read, Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Let us pray. Lord, we are confronted daily by different choices. Help us to go your way. Help us to grow in you. And help, help us to, to live the way you have planned for us. Each day we make a variety of choices. What to eat, what to wear, where to go. Most of the time we don't even notice the choices we are making. But at this time we pause to call to mind the choice we had to make this week that was more important. And we think about how we came to our decision. Lord, if we made a bad choice, forgive us. If the choice was hard, give us your peace. If we are still awaiting the consequences, give us patience. We now look ahead to the week in front of us. Maybe there are hard decisions to be made. Maybe we don't know if we will be confronted by difficult choices. But whatever happens, Lord, our deepest desire is to make the right choices, to listen for your guidance and to go your way. Help us to be attuned to your voice, not be ashamed or afraid to seek advice. Help us to be prepared to change our minds if we discern you leading us in a different direction. Lord, we pray for those in our local communities who need to make choices and decisions this week. We think of the health service. We pray for those who may receive difficult, life-changing diagnosis. We pray for doctors or 
and other health professionals who need to advise patients on their care options. We pray for carers, nurses. We pray for teachers and students, particularly at this difficult exam time. Give those taking exams your peace and focus as they decide what to write on their exam papers. Help our young people to make good choices about their next steps. Give them good guidance, we pray, so that the outcomes will be positive for their futures. We bring before you, Lord, all those we know who have asked for our prayers. We remember those who are sick. We remember those who are bereaving. We lift up those who are sorrowful, lonely, isolated, or afraid. We ask for your help as we seek to bring them comfort. Help us to be joy bringers into every difficult situation. Lord, we remember those whose life choices have not been good and have led to painful or devastating consequences. We remember those in prison and their families, those who are in serious debt, those in situations where they no longer feel safe and loved. We think about local businesses and our places of work. Where might we need to make decisions this week? Where might our decisions have serious consequences for others? Lord, in the quiet, we bring those situations to you and asking for your wisdom to fill us as we go forward into a new week. In our homes and families and social situations, Lord, guide us and help us each day to make the right choices that will bring harmony and peace rather than conflict and argument. Help us to be quicker to listen than to speak. Give us discerning hearts. Help us always to be guided by you. Give us your heavenly wisdom and show us the right paths to follow. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand to sing our next praise, Blessed Assurance.
I'm reading God's word from Psalm 125. Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. The scatterer of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous. For then the righteous might use their hands to do evil. Lord, do good to those who are good, to those who are upright in heart. But those who turn to crooked ways, the Lord will banish with the evildoers. Peace be on Israel. Amen. Psalm 125 describes eternal security as Christians. All Christians believe and agree on the important doctrines of the faith, such as the deity of Jesus, that Jesus is God, that Jesus died on the cross. He suffered for our sins. Jesus' resurrection from the dead, that he is alive, he is King of kings and Lord of lords, and we are to trust and obey him as our King and our Lord. And all Christians believe and agree that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. Only by believing in Jesus, we can have peace with our Creator. If we don't believe in Jesus, as the Bible describes, we have no place in heaven. All Christians from every denomination agree on these, as these are the foundations of our faith. Those who do not agree with they, these, they are not Christians, just like the Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses who are trying to pose as Christians but reject uh, the Bible's clear teaching on these issues. So there are, there are primary doctrines all Christians agree on. And then there are secondary questions we Christians might disagree. And hence we have different denominations. One of these is the question of eternal security. This is a secondary question. There are those Christians who believe Christians are not eternally secure. Those Christians believe that once people accepted Jesus as their Savior and Lord, but if they do not walk the straight and narrow way and die in that condition, they would go to hell as if they had never been saved. As I studied my Bible, I don't believe that genuine Christians, and I have to emphasize genuine Christians, could lose their salvation. The Westminster Confession of Faith is talking about the perseverance of the saints in chapter 17. That's only three brief paragraphs. If you are up for it, let me know. I'm more than happy to, to send it over to you to read it through. It's a really encouraging and uplifting three chapters. So, um, sorry, three paragraphs. The truth of eternal security is this. Once a person confesses his or her sin to God and trusts in Jesus, who died as an atonement on the cross, then that person is converted. He is saved forever, even if he doesn't know it. It is possible for a person to be converted and still not believe in the eternal security. But that's all right. That doesn't change the fact that God saved him or her. 
Psalm 125 as a whole describes the only two kinds of people in the world. Those who trusted in the true God and those who have not trusted the true God. Verses 1, 2 and 4 describes the first category and 3 and 4 describes the second category. And this psalm shares three truths about those who put their trust in the Lord. The first one is that they are selected. Believers, genuine Christians are selected. Verse 1 we read, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. Mount Zion is another name for Jerusalem, which was a chosen city. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, that every person who is saved, who believes in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, was chosen by God. Writing to Timothy, Paul said, This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. 2 Timothy 1, verses 8 and 9. It is possible that someone's identity is so shaken up that the only sense of security you have is that the Lord chose you. That he has sent his affection on you. Perhaps you have not been selected for anything in this world before. But what does it matter if you have come to trust in Jesus? Then he has chosen you. He wanted you to be in his team. The focus is really on God's love and on his work that he chose you that he saved you as he died on the cross for you. And he is the one in enabling Christians' hearts to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. The focus is on the Lord's working here. He is the one who chose us. Because of what God has done, what he is doing and what he will do, the elect shall certainly persevere. And all who truly believe in Jesus will be eternally saved. God preserves his people and therefore they persevere. The selected will endure forever because God is good and he is mighty to save. So the first thing we learn from Psalm 125 about believers that they are selected. The second is that they are surrounded. Verse 2 says, As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. Not only are all those who trust in the Lord selected, they are also surrounded. One way the Lord surrounds his people is with angels. Angels are God's messengers sent to serve those who will inherit salvation, as we read in Hebrews 1 verse 14. Angels are sent to serve those who will inherit salvation salvation. And Psalm 34 verse 7 says, the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. So if you have trusted in the Lord, you have at least one angel with you all the times. We are not to talk to them. We are not to communicate with them. Please don't get me wrong. Angels are messengers sent by God. They have a certain task to do. And we have the privilege to talk to God Almighty directly. 
we don't have to communicate to the messengers. In fact, we are not to talk to them, not to initiate any conversation with them. Neither we have to be afraid of them or scared of them. God is sending his angels to protect and serve his children who will inherit salvation. Hebrews 1 verse 14. God surrounds his people, not only by his angels. Believers are also surrounded by affection. David sang in Psalm 139 verses 17 and 18. How precious also are your thoughts, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. Have you ever picked a handful of sand on the beach and tried to count how many grains are there? They are even smaller than the mustard seed. There is one thing I'm convinced of. When we get to heaven and find out how much God loves us, we will feel ashamed that we could ever have doubted God's love for us. Great is his affection. Great is his love for his people. So believers are surrounded by angels and also by God's love, God's affection. We are also surrounded by admonitions. God warns his children. Listen to this word from Psalm 19, verse 11. By them, your servant is warned. And with the them, he's referring to the commandments of the Lord. By the commands of, um, of his word, by, by God's commands, your servant is warned. Although we are loved with an everlasting love, God doesn't like when we are stepping out of the line. Eternal security is not a blank check that we can put anything on it, that we can do whatever we want and we always be forgiven. Then then we have to check whether the person is a genuine Christian, a genuine believer. We cannot live the way just the way we want. If we start doing so, God will chasten us severely. We should never cast our eyes in the direction of the world, the flesh, the devil, to what is sinful or to anything that is unlike Jesus. God does not save us in order to give us a green light to live any way we please. If we disobey him, he will put us on our back. God has a way to make us to say genuinely that I am sorry. Please forgive me. I'm repenting this way. I need your grace to do it differently from now on. It is because we are saved that God puts us on our back if we step out of the line. God entered into a covenant with us. And he owns us. We are bought with a precious price. By the blood of Jesus Christ. He owns us. We belong to him. God is mighty to save what belongs to him. Those who trust in the Lord are selected. They are surrounded and lastly, They are secure. How secure? Let me put it like this. God loves them as much as the Father loves Jesus. In John chapter 17, verse 23, Jesus actually prayed, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity then the world will know that you sent me 
and have loved me, sorry, and have loved them even as you have loved me. And have loved them even as you have loved me. Romans 8, 17 says that all who are saved are joint heirs with Christ. Do you have any idea how much Father God loves Jesus, the Son? God loves, Father God loves the Son more than any earthly human can possibly love their children. What do you think? What are the chances that Jesus would be excluded from the Trinity? It is impossible that Jesus could somehow be disenfranchised and the Father say, I don't want you anymore. And those who trust in the Lord are loved the same way by God the Father. And we are secure. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. We are surrounded by love and cannot be dislodged. Nothing can separate believers from the love of Christ. And no one can bring any charge against those whom God has chosen to make him change his mind. Those who trust in the Lord have had the righteousness of Jesus transferred to them. In Romans 4, 6, this transaction is called imputed righteousness. Not something we have earned, but something that's been put into us. That is why believers are secure. Our God is mighty to save. Nothing can separate believers from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, says Romans 8, 39. Believers are loved with an everlasting love. In Christ, they are selected, they are surrounded, and they are secure. How does it make you feel today? Is it good news for you? Can you rejoice that God chose you, he wanted you, that he is with you, he will never leave you, he is surrounding you, and that you are safe and secure in his almighty hands? If it's not a good news for you, would you please check your commitment, your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ? Let us sing our closing hymn as a proclamation of our faith in Christ alone. Oh, 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 oh,
May you continue to stand in the power and in the love of Christ. May you be strengthened by his true word. May you know his presence with you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.